Buddhism was first officially introduced to America at the Parliament of the World's Religions held in Chicago in 1893. Now, a hundred years since then, Buddhism is flourishing in this land. It is a new kind of culture. It is a sincere and dynamic catalyst for change. This is the Pacific Zen Institute in California. The members of this institute who train in meditation have gathered at a forest. They have borrowed this place for a seven-day retreat. All of the participants are lay people. <laughs> Great, well, thank you. It will be a seven-day long journey of the heart. This is the person who will be leading that journey. He is John Tarrant, the founder of the Pacific Zen Institute. He is one of the most famous teachers of Buddhism in America, and he is also a layman. Unlike in Asia, where people become monks in order to practice Buddhism, most Americans practice Buddhism at home. No fear! They practice Buddhism in their daily lives, and they transform their lives through spiritual training. No hate! There are some people who just really, it's their life. They have some inner experience that says, I'm just going to, I do this. This is what I do. You know, this is what I care about most. And this is the great focus of my life. Buddhism in America is not so interested in what it looks like outside but more the inner personal experience and so people can be in a supermarket and nobody knows they're a Buddhist sort of thing. They can be working in a bank or they could be working in a law firm or something like that. You know. Here lay people are interested in practicing but they don't just want to make prayers and offerings. <clears throat> they want to do meditation. They want to learn to transform their heart so that the practices of the monastery are being integrated into the lives of lay people. Westerners do not identify as monastics because they don't take monks' vows, but they're very much interested in the deepest practices and understandings of Buddhism, how to train in wisdom, how to understand emptiness, how to train in mindfulness, how to live and embody a life of compassion and the paramitas or the perfections of the Buddha. Some of the people who've stuck with this for 20, 25, and 30 years uh, they really um, have come to know a lot of peace and a lot of joy, and it has enriched their life. And um, uh, the community is based on that, and so that's been very helpful for new people who, who see that. And also the other message is, that the challenge is, is it possible to go deeply without being a monk or a nun? They care about the quality of their life, and they care about their families. They care about uh, their jobs but they want to find a new way of relating to it so that they don't suffer so much. Training is a way to meet with one's true self. They are offering a wide range of programs, such as weekly training and teaching sessions and conversations with the teacher here at the Pacific Zen Institute. This is the same for the roughly 1,000 Buddhism centers and temples all over America. Session retreats are also constantly held. There are overnight retreats as well as three-month-long retreats. Um, retreats are a time when people can put aside whatever they do in their daily lives and come and have silence and have meditation and work with koans. And I, we think of it as time when you can experience life without the usual delusions and chaos. And um, it's also something when you sit, when you meditate, uh, you meditate because, you know, it, it does calm you and make your life freer and more vivid and, and 
but there's this other thing that fundamentally makes life kinder, and mm. and um, and so you sit not just for yourself, but for other people who can't sit, and so there's a sort of bodhisattva path there. We have many people from all over the world who do our intensive practice periods. Some are, you know, rather famous, like Jane Fonda. Some are uh, completely impoverished, who come from, you know, third world countries. Uh, some people are great scholars uh, who come here, or researchers like uh, Dr. Alfred Kasniak, who's a neuroscientist. Mm. Diversity is very important to me. But when we all get together in the Zendo, and we're doing, as my first teacher, De San Sanim, Sung Song, he said, together action. We're really on one track together. There's a kind of mutual entrainment that happens where the self begins to drop away, and that's very powerful. And in that experience, we begin to actualize the fundamental insight related to non-duality. One of the things I'm very much aware of is, is how much we're all in a conversation about how to make this great ancient tradition alive here. And we're experimenting and discovering every day you know, new ways to do that. So I'm just somebody with nothing to do <laughs> so whether I'm doing something or not. <laughs> the relationship between teacher and student is cooperative and equal. They are companions who are on a spiritual journey together. <laughs> the monk said, I went to my teacher with nothing, and I returned with nothing. And the uh, companion said, well, then why did you bother to go? And he said, well, how would I have known that I went with nothing? Uh, that, there are many ways of pointing at the student-teacher relationship, but that, that is very fundamental to the student-teacher relationship as far. It, it describes it better than anything I've heard. Um, the the student-teacher relationship is not, uh, it's not a medical model or the psychotherapeutic model or anything. It is, it is based on uh, a journey to undiscovered country that uh, someone is making, and uh, the guide just says, come on, let's do this together, if you wish. Uh, we're fundamentally equals. We both have the Buddha nature, and we both have our attachments and our delusions. The Asian teacher comes here and is teaching the way or giving the description of the relationship the way it was in Asia, people here misunderstand it. And we start to think, oh, I stop thinking, I listen to what the teacher says, and I just do that, and that's it. And that's, that's not it, you know. The Buddha really emphasized we need to be intelligent, we need to be thoughtful, we need to think about things, we need to follow ethical conduct, you know, and if a teacher teaches you to do something that is not ethical, you have every right and every need to say no, you know. And so I think the relationship is about developing wisdom, not about becoming a groupie, and not about having your spiritual teacher be mommy or daddy. When absorbing Asian Buddhism, Americans incorporated Western values. They valued their families and their lives, and their Buddhism became centered around the secular. They put an importance on experience, and laymen participated willingly in training. They took an alternative spiritual path to the one taken by their Asian counterparts. Buddhism has become a way of life for countless Americans. The sudden rise of Buddhism is deeply related to its merger with psychology.
This is the Spirit Rock Meditation Center, which is located in Woodacre, California. This is a meditation center for lay people, and they mainly practice vipassana meditation of Southern Buddhism. This is Jack Cornfield, the center's founder. He is called one of America's greatest spiritual leaders. He trained as a monk in Korea, Thailand, and India before returning to the U.S. in the mid-70s and acquiring a doctorate's degree in clinical psychology and combining the consultation methods of psychologists with Vipassana Buddhism. Since then, countless scholars have worked to merge Buddhism with psychology. Studies have shown that Buddhist meditation helps relieve the symptoms of stress, depression, and attention deficit disorder. Sylvia Borstein, who is leading the Wednesday morning class here, is also a psychologist. We have two of the ten paramitas. We have equanimity and patience. So what else do you notice is different about you, Barbara? A reawakening or a deeper connection to wonder. Uh -huh. I've actually started a practice each morning of, instead of like, oh, I have to do this today or this needs to happen, to say, I wonder what will happen today. Uh -huh. But not in a totally blonde way. <laughs> Just with being open to, being conscious that I have choices on how I approach from the first moment that I'm awake. Except I'm thinking about... Um, Morality is the second paramita, and I'm thinking the, the thought in one's mind in the morning, what can I do today for the benefit of all beings, is a way to reframe the morality so it's not don't do this and don't do that, but what could I possibly do that would make this planet a better place to be? Because I wanted to start with re-examining some of the things that we say all the time about practice and about Buddhism. And I also wanted to start systematically with reviewing through the lens of Sila Samadhi Panya, of the three aspects of the path to awakening. Very, very, very. And I was a psychologist before I actually began my practice in, uh, with Buddhist meditation. And uh, people often ask me, what, ask me, what do you do differently with your clients now people come? And my sense, this brings it right, really back to psychotherapeutic meaning. When I have not pushed somebody away in my mind, because I've had a judgment about them, they should have done it this way or this way or this way. Uh, but actually, I have compassion in my mind. They couldn't have done it another way. They will feel the compassion that I have. It's as palpable in the world. One of the interesting connections that's happening as Dharma grows in America is that between Eastern and Western psychology. Buddhism in many ways is a psychology of mind. The Dalai Lama calls it a science of mind. We understand how the mind works, how the mind creates suffering, and how the mind and heart can be free of suffering. My work over the years has been to bring Buddhist teaching and psychology to many, many Western therapists and psychologists. I've gone to conferences and taught thousands and thousands of American psychologists and psychiatrists the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the teachings of impermanence and selflessness. They, on the other hand, have taught to Buddhist practitioners here ways of being aware of their emotions that are not so carefully spelled out in Buddhist training, ways of working with the uh, suffering of their family history to release them. And those can be actually done as mindfulness practices. So it's not separate from Buddhism, but there are some way in which they are supporting one another. When people are coming with strong emotional or psychological issues, and they're really caught in them in some way, sometimes it's not enough to simply say, well, just be mindful of it. And so there's a little bit of an investigation on a psychological level. Well, what's this about? How is it being fed? You know, what is its root? But there's also a point where people have enough balance in their own minds where they really can look at it meditatively and are not so lost in their own particular story, but at this point really seeing the nature of the emotion itself. So it would be like, 
It's not what I'm angry about. It's about what is the nature of anger. And so then we're getting more into the meditative understanding. It comes up in your mind. Those reflections um, that we just There has been an increased about. interest in Buddhism with increasing awareness that Buddhism helps heal wounds of the heart. In 2002, 15 million Americans practiced Buddhist meditation as a form of therapy. It's hard not to. Thanks to this, Americans have become more interested in the fundamental beliefs of Buddhism. Not in her ability to handle at that time. Actually, I think that's a very good place to end up on. Well, here's that. a metaphor. Um, it's like you're in prison. You know, that's the Four Noble Truths. We're in prison. We're suffering. Not only that, the prison's burning. <laughs> and uh, so, and um, if psychology goes to a room that's not burning, you know, or it, it, you're in prison and it, its idea is to make the prison nicer. It brings in a nice couch, it paints the walls a different color, you know. It shows you a movie of outside, you know. And the Dharma just is a demolition project. It takes down the prison walls. And so your idea of having, psychology is often adjusting your idea of having a self. But if you really, the deeper you go into the Dharma, the self disappears. And, um, and, and your, your connection with the universe, like subject-object connection with the universe changes. So you feel much more part of things. And, and I think that's part of the, the sense of kindness. You're not fundamentally trying to hold yourself together against the world. You're part of the world and you appreciate the world and want to be helpful to the world. Personally, I believe that Buddhism takes psychology to a, a greater level. One of, the, one of the core pieces, maybe, is that, uh, you know, there's this psychology understanding that I believe is Freudian, old uh, understanding, where uh, the thought was that good psychotherapy could transform neurotic suffering into ordinary suffering. And then that was the goal. That was sort of like all we can do as therapists, just help people suffer in an ordinary way. Where, of course, Buddhism uh, is taking that beyond uh, ordinary suffering to non-suffering, to liberation, to uh, the possibility of actual no suffering at all, enlightenment. While psychology focuses on the suffering of the self, Buddhism helps one become aware of the suffering of others. Here, People talk about someone who is suffering five minutes before the meditation ends. We'll be going on dialysis and waiting for a new kidney. May her healing be easy and speedy. Two wonderful teenage girls who, who lost their mom to cancer last week. Sarah Becca, her son David, she's a single mom, and pray for them and all the challenges that they face together. By meditating on the suffering of others, people here experience compassion. There are many women leaders in American Buddhism, like Sylvia Borstein, who is leading this meditation. Maitripa College is a school of Tibetan Buddhism. The Dalai Lama first visited the U.S. in 1972. Afterwards, Tibetan Buddhism received widespread popularity and support. Today, the venerable Tubten Chodron is visiting for a lecture. She is an American nun and student of the Dalai Lama, as well as one of the three most famous nuns in the world. She teaches Buddhism all over the world in a down-to-earth and practical manner. 
we say we want to be happy, what is it really that we're looking for? Unlike in Tibet, which has no nuns, American Buddhists recognize women as teachers. Yeah, you have some, some advice for your... Thanks to American values of equality, the women are given an equal status and role as the men here. Uh, I was among the first generation of Westerners to ordain in the Tibetan tradition, and uh, the Tibetans are a refugee population, at least our, our teachers are, because it's so difficult to go into Tibet and study there. And so there were not facilities for us in Asia to stay in, and there's not facilities in the West. And our Tibetan teachers are very concerned about uh, reestablishing their own Tibetan monasteries in exile. So we Western monastics were kind of left to fend for ourselves. And so there weren't monasteries for us to stay in. There wasn't financial support. It was really quite difficult. But the venerable Tubten Chadron overcame these difficulties and founded an abbey in 2003. This is the Sravasti Abbey, located in a suburb of Washington State. This is a place where both monks and nuns can train in Buddhism. It is open not only to monastics, but to lay people as well. Lay people who want to experience the life of a monastic or who want to practice Shashin come here. Having the opportunity to live a renunciate life. Many people commented to me that just knowing that the Abbey was here inspired them, knowing that there was a group of individuals who were trying to live a simple lifestyle, who were trying to cultivate love and compassion, that they found it tremendously inspiring for their own life when they were busy in the city. So we're all related, we're all interconnected. Uh, really seeing this and feeling this. In America, about half the leaders and monastics of Buddhism are women. This is why American Buddhism is different from traditionally male-centered Asian Buddhism. When Buddhism comes to America, it starts to take on already some American qualities. Um, it's becoming more feminine. There are more female teachers than there are in most Buddhist countries. And the quality of the feminine, which is uh, relational and uh, compassionate more than heroic struggle, um, is the quality that you see in much of Buddhism in America. This is something I know um, there's a, quite a bit of resistance in Asia. I've experienced it myself as I've traveled in Japan and China, uh, Tibet, and Southeast Asia. But I'm a brave woman. Mm -hmm. It hasn't bothered me so much. And uh, I think that uh, the empowerment of women in Western culture, of Buddhist teachers, uh, many uh, women who are uh, abbesses of, or abbots of monasteries, many women who are fully authorized to teach in the highest ranks of uh, all of Buddhism, who are coming from uh, the West, it's having a deep impact uh, on uh, Asia. The 1960s beat movement played a pivotal role in this empowerment of women. It was a confusing time for Americans with the Vietnam War, the assassination of President Kennedy, and racial tensions. The beat movement became interested in Buddhism as an alternative to the Western culture that caused such chaos and destruction. This merger of the beat movement, which also contained the feminist movement with Buddhism, helped foster an atmosphere of sexual equality. Well, I think diversity and inclusiveness are very, very important, uh, especially for Buddhism to exist in places like America, where it's such a diverse culture. 
And so I think one thing that's very important is gender equality. So this is a big transition step from the way Buddhism is often practiced in Asia. But the Buddha wanted everybody to get enlightened and he wanted everybody, so for everybody to get enlightened, everybody needs equal practice opportunities. So I think we need to, to really open things up in terms of gender inclusiveness. All beings are precious. The Buddhist belief that all people are equal also means that men and women are equal. The equality that can be found in American Buddhism is even influencing the Buddhism of Asia. This is Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the southwestern United States. There is a unique temple here. It is the Upaya Zen Center. It is a place for lay people to lead communal lives while practicing Buddhism. This kind of lifestyle, which is neither monastic nor secular, is a distinctive feature of American Buddhism. Sure this is Joan <laughs> Halifax, the founder of the center. She is a well-known Buddhist lay teacher and activist. In 1980, she also founded the Zen Peacemaker Order, along with Bernie Glassman, a pioneer of socially engaged Buddhism. So we be a refuge for those men, some other dimensions in here. And that reminds me of the three ten tenets of the Peacemaker Order, Zen Peacemaker Order of Roshi Bernie Glassman. The first tenet is of not knowing. How do you sit there with a really open mind, really as a beginner? Right. Not knowing is most intimate, said a great Zen teacher. And then the second tenet is bearing witness. How do you presence the joy and suffering of the world? without the conceptual mind mediating your experience, how can you be present in an unfiltered way to things just as they are? And the third tenet is loving action. Out of not knowing and bearing witness, the response of kindness to the world and of compassion. How do we respond? So those tenets guide me in my work as a socially engaged Buddhist and also have guided me for many years in my practice of zazen. Leaders in socially engaged Buddhism, the people here are making their voices heard on social issues. They are also active volunteers. Since 1970, they have been running a hospice program here. They are helping people who are facing death to accept it in peace. At some point today, you'll check in with Shinzan on Doan training. I have seen that we keep the lights on pretty often. And please put the lights on. Out. There's also a program for convicts. Through consultations and meditation, convicts are made to see themselves and the world in a different light. But we have individual report backs from inmates who've been through the program who say, this has in fact changed my life. And there are now films coming out, films being made in United States prisons that show the benefit of meditation retreats where inmates are 
interviewed after a retreat and they say, you know, I am a different person from this. So what else can you go on? We don't have, uh, we have some recidivism uh, reduction uh, in, at uh, Grants, New Mexico, what we call Western State Prison. Uh, there is a meditation pod that has been functioning and they have shown a drop in their recidivism rate by 50%. So this mental training is a base, but at the same time, our engagement with the world, our political engagement, our engagement in education, our engagement in the medical system, our engagement in deep social questions like, for example, war. Wars are being waged all over the planet. We practice nonviolence, non-harming to the best of our ability. We're deeply opposed to war. And we can't just have those feelings. For in my particular center, we have to act upon those feelings. We have to engage politically. You know, we're very active in getting out the vote in the current election. Um, we're very verbal in our Dharma talks about the uh, terrible social and global illness that arises from the presence of harming, of war, of violence particularly violence against women and children. The social engagement is based on strict practice. There's a room in one corner of the center where teachers and students can converse one-on-one. -on -one. It's time to check the progress of a student. The biggest obstacle to your practice. The biggest obstacle um, for me right now is um, to get uh, lost in um, in my uh, overwhelming feelings. Um, sadness is sadness. caused by the suffering of the world, um, and this sadness brings God, about mercy. Uh, Situation the Buddhists the of America general, have awakened to this mercy and are actively engaged in society. They participate in various volunteer programs and work towards eliminating war and racial prejudice. Like, um, after a big wave, uh, came and... Buddha was an engaged uh, revolutionary. He was a, 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 um, a reformer of not only uh, spiritual views in ancient India, but also of uh, classist, sexist oppression that was happening. Um, so I take the Buddha as my teacher and as my role model, and I believe that it's part of a, a Buddhist practice to be engaged. Now, I don't think we need to wait until we've been enlightened, as he did, in order to do so. For me, it feels very much a part of the path to enlightenment to try to create a positive change, to practice generosity and giving, to practice um, some level of serving and engaging. So one of the first ways that I uh, started to be of service was going back into jails to teach people to meditate, to be of service uh, in that way. Uh, I also worked for many years uh, with uh, people on the streets doing outreach, working with homeless people, working with HIV and AIDS education. Um, so from the beginning, it's been very important to be engaged, to be of service. The ethic of uh, democracy or um, human rights, which is, is, has become fundamentally a part of Western thinking, we assume that. And I think that that actually inspires a lot of people to bring that into their practice uh, of Dharma. I like to think also that Dharma practice itself inspires that uh, um, a, a rededicated fervor for social justice action through really uh, increased realization of the suffering in the world, which I think has to inspire compassion. The self and the world are not separate. That is why one changes oneself and the world through practice. In America, Buddhists are putting this truth into practice through social engagement. 
Although Joan Halifax is a Zen Buddhist herself, she is open to various branches of Buddhism, and her students practice in a wide variety of ways. This kind of openness is also a distinctive feature of Buddhism here. This is the Blue Heron Zen community located in Seattle, Washington. The leaders of various branches of Buddhism have gathered together here. They are all part of the Northwest Dharma Association. They gather together like this once a year. This helps foster an atmosphere of friendship and exchange between the various traditions and branches of Buddhism. In this way, the Buddhism of various countries can be found in America. There's Buddhism from Korea, Japan, Tibet, and Sri Lanka here. This is the first time in history that something like this has happened. American pluralism has allowed these various traditions to recognize and accept one another. This diversity makes American Buddhism all the richer. Some centers teach the practices of various branches, while some teachers study the various traditions before teaching a combination of what they have learned. The various Buddhist traditions of Asia have come together in America. Americans and Western practitioners are now bringing together these different elements. At first, for the Asian teachers and for Western teachers in very strict traditions, this was a problem and they didn't know how to deal with it. But little by little now, as you could see from the meeting today, people are having to learn how to work together. So the Theravadan teachers are now working with the Tibetan teachers in the West. The Korean and Japanese teachers are working with one another. So there's a tremendous new kind of Dharma happening. And I think it's very healthy for the Dharma as a whole. And I myself have been enriched by cross-training. I mean, I've been sitting Zen since 1965. So wonderful. That's very uh, useful. But in the course of uh, these many years, I've had the chance to study with Theravadan teachers and Tibetan teachers. I feel deeply enriched by that. Um, the perspective that I've uh, been enriched by in terms of the Tibetan practice has been a great emphasis on compassion. And on the other side, the perspective that I've been enriched by in the Theravadan practice has been the study of the Pali Canon, the essence teachings of the Buddha. Very useful. But my Zen practice is my root. I spent many, many years in the Theravada tradition of Vipassana meditation, 20, 30 years, you know, immersed in that. And then at a certain point, a friend who had been studying with Tibetan teachers uh, said, well, well, why don't you come meet some of these teachers? And I did and began some of the Tibetan practices. Uh, and for some time, there was a real problem in my mind because even though the practice, the practices were not really in conflict. When I understood, it, it's not that. It's just different skillful means, different skillful methods for actually liberating the mind from grasping and clinging. Well, then everything became just a useful tool. We could describe it this way. Does it free the mind? We describe it the opposite way. Does it free the mind? Once we've established a depth of understanding in one tradition, and we really have a good, balanced, 
deep understanding of, of the teachings from experience, then to study in other traditions with other teachers only enriches it. We begin to see it from other sides and other angles. Also, new forms of Buddhism are being created. The Against the Stream Buddhist Meditation Society is part of such a current. They have 25 centers nationwide. Against the Stream is the translation of a Pali term, the old Buddhist language term uh, that translates, it's, uh, the original word is uh, patiso tagami and it translates as against the stream. And it's recorded of just after the Buddha's enlightenment, um, when he was reflecting on uh, his path and the meditative practice and everything that had brought him to this newfound freedom. And he referred to his experience as having gone against the stream. And he said that the path uh, to this freedom was uh, almost, for me, it feels like a, f a form of rebellion, of going against these sort of uh, false promises that you'll be happy if you get enough pleasure or enough stuff. So the renunciation being against the stream and uh, even just uh, meditating and sitting still and training your mind uh, is so kind of a form uh, of, uh, I guess what I'm wanting to say is that mindfulness, present time awareness is against the stream. Noah Levine calls his society Dharma Punk. He says like punk culture, one must go against the stream in order to reach the truth. Graham. Celeste. Natalie. Sam. It's relaxing into sitting up and uh, letting your hands rest however uh, is comfortable to you. Noah Levine is a student of Jack Cornfield an authority on Vipassana meditation. He also received his qualification as a teacher from him. Allow your body to breathe in its own natural rhythm. Not necessary to control the breath. Attempting to meet it with mercy and care rather than resistance and hatred. Noah Levine is a second generation Buddhist. And he founded his own society based on his practice and understanding of Buddhism. The only thing that I would say maybe is a big part of our practice that isn't included in that Eightfold Path is uh, metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, uh, upeka, and mudita, sympathetic joy and uh, uh, equanimity. So those are a, a large part of our training here and practice. Although they're not technically in the Eightfold Path, they're a little bit later teachings from the Buddha. Um, we also do quite a bit of uh, forgiveness meditation practice. So many people, myself included, that uh, practice in this way have a lot of uh, pain of the past and a lot of anger and resentment, sometimes towards ourselves, sometimes towards others, or guilt or shame about how we've been unskillful. And so I tend to teach uh, quite a bit of forgiveness meditation, of encouraging people to actually sit and offer forgiveness and ask for forgiveness as part of a meditation practice. Someone had insulted me and it hurt my feelings somehow. Um, I could say, oh, I'm cool, I'm fine, I'm totally cool. But you know, no. that didn't hurt, you know, right. but obviously that's denial. Yeah. Um, or, you know, how do I tell the difference between that and saying, uh, wow, that really hurt and I'm gonna let that pain go through me and then go on with my life. Yeah. I guess it's just, uh, the difference is honesty. Because even when we're saying, I'm cool, you know, that didn't hurt, we know we are actually hurting. So it's really quite kind of, it's aversion to the pain. It's resistance or de suppression or denial of the pain is there. 
Um, so I guess the answer is the difference between denial is actually just accepting it, it's there, and uh, uh, responding appropriately, which is with some compassion, with some uh, honesty towards it, and saying, this really hurt, you know? I am really offended, and what it, even if it's just my ego is bruised or whatever, but it feels like this. I understand the inevitability of life. It is the younger generation that is mainly interested in the society. In order to connect more easily with them, Noah Levine dresses and acts casually. There are no formalities here. It doesn't make it hurt. Uh, it doesn't take the pain. Of I don't encourage much bowing uh, or any of that. Partially just because that's not an American uh, tradition. It's uh, I, I understand it and actually quite appreciate that it's a, a beautiful uh, tradition in Asia. But here in the States, I feel like sometimes people are trying to, rather than be kind, loving people, they're trying to be Asian. They're trying to take on the form of Asian Buddhism uh, rather than being a Buddha, rather than being an American Buddha that uh, our tradition is to shake hands, <clears throat> excuse me, to shake hands or to hug. Although if you saw me in the room with, with one of my main teachers, Ajahn Amaro, I probably would be bowing some out of deep respect for him and his tradition. But um, for me and my tradition in uh, in the States, bowing isn't really part of it, and sort of uh, reverence of statues uh, or images isn't really part of it. We're much more interested, I'm much more interested in people experiencing Buddha nature or their own uh, possibility of liberation than externalizing it into form. That is built into us. Buddhism in America that is developing into a wide variety of forms. Somehow create a life that's going to feel An American all Buddhism all that's right for American culture life. is being made. What he was teaching. So I enjoy each moment I have with it. I think that we have to remain re loyal to the, the, to the traditional teachings. But in terms of the form and the way a community is organized or the way the precepts are kept in a certain culture, you know, these more external elements, those are where I feel the adaptation occurs, okay? So for example, here uh, we do our chanting in English, okay? And uh, we're making up some of our own melodies. In terms of keeping the monastic precepts, while some of them are difficult to keep exactly per the letter, because the situation is so much different here than it was in India 26 centuries ago, then we look at the precepts and what was the reason that the Buddha spoke that precept? What mental state was he trying to get at? And then we apply that to where we are now. There's a long association between Zen and the arts, you know, and, and I think it's because Art can explain things to people differently from philosophy, the way philosophy can. And, and I think that's sort of useful that people will be attracted to that. You know? So we have, you know, music and so as musicians have come along, we've gradually started doing Western songs. And we've, we've, we've translated the sutras and had a, a long ongoing translation for, for Collins as well as sutras. Two thousand six hundred years ago, Buddha appeared with his revolutionary teachings in India. Now, his truths are blossoming anew every time they are spread to a new land. Through practice, Americans are dreaming of an inner revolution and a true change in the world. They are creating a new kind of Buddhism. So what does the future hold in store for American Buddhism? Now there is one Dharma again, many forms. 
So it's like, a, it's like a white light that has been split into colors and is now reconverging to the central issues of the Dharma. Here in the States, I think we're still in the process of finding out what uh, a, an American container might look like. Now, uh, the container, from my perspective, is always has to be the five precepts has to be an ethical behavior container uh, for, uh, for awakening. Some of our American culture needs to settle down and we need to get rid of this push button approach it, because it's not a thing of hurry up and get it done. It's a thing of creating the causes over a long period of time. One of the interesting things that may happen in the future is that as Buddhism finds a, a new language in modern American culture, it may be interesting to the people of Burma or Japan or Korea or Thailand. And now we find teachers from America being invited a little bit back to those countries for people who are interested in learning about Buddhism from a modern uh, American cultural perspective. So now we have the privilege of together supporting the Dharma around the world.